Okay. Yeah. Right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Scottsdale Big Book Study, where we will study the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Maria F and I'm a recovered compulsive overeater. I'm from County Dublin in Ireland and I am your host for today's study. Our co-hosts today are Nancy J, Sue L, Audrey N and yes, yeah, so three hosts. If you have any questions or any concerns during the meeting, please contact either the host or any of the co-hosts by private message and you can do this in the chat function. Please also note that our speaker today, Harlan G, will be recorded for the duration of the study. However, the question and answer <laughs> sessions which follows will not be recorded. But today we are reading from page 88, 83 of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. We've put a link in the previous week's recordings in the chat function. So in that you'll get a link to the previous week's recordings and to the seventh tradition payment. We kindly ask if you could please keep your microphone on mute at all times during today's study. And also, if you need to step away from your camera for any reason at all, if you could please just disconnect your camera just during the time that you're away from it. And now we are going to go over to Harlan G in Scottsdale in Arizona. Good morning, Harlan. Good morning, Maria. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm very very honored to, to be here, very thrilled. I hope all of you are enjoying a wonderful Saturday, whether you're listening on podcast or live. It is just an absolutely astounding day here in Arizona, and I hope it is one uh, where you are as well. Um, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. We were just talking about this, but just so you remind us, tomorrow, the rest of the country is going to be on daylight savings time. Now, Arizona does not change their clocks or their minds. No, they don't change their clocks. And so what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen moving forward is I'm going to change on Saturday morning so you don't have to. The only change will be if you are in the state of Arizona, this meeting, this big book study will begin at 10 a.m. rather than 11 a.m. It is now 11 a.m. in Arizona. Next week, we will start this at 10 Pacific time, and it will start at 11 Mountain, and it will be at uh, noon central and one Eastern. I actually am going home. I will be doing this from uh, right, right outside Poop Park in Arlington Heights, Illinois. I'll be perusing Poop Park from a penthouse most of that weekend, but that's where I'll be doing it. Uh, but I will hold to the times. Uh, so let's do that. Okay. That said, we're going to now begin at page 83. But before we do, I just want to sort of give us a running start as to what we were talking about last week. And we were talking about the, the ninth step. We were talking about the amends making process, which is so critical to our development spiritually. You know, one of the purposes of the steps is to make me right with God, right with myself, and right with my fellow human being. And the steps that are most important in making me right with my fellow human being are obviously eight and nine. Those are the steps where I really get right with others, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, very, very critical. Well, they're all critical. They're not, there's no steps that are not critical. But we're going to be talking this morning about the promises and why do the promises come between steps nine and 10. Now, just to be fair, just to be accurate, there are promises all through this book. This book is laden rich with promises all over it and prayer and all these other various warnings and prayer and all this stuff. But when we look at the the promises that we most look at, we're looking at the bottom of page 83. And what we want to look at when we read this is we want to look at the development of a human being that's in recovery. And let's read the first full sentence here, and then I'm going to stop and we're going to talk, okay? If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. Let's stop right there. Painstaking means with great effort. 
It means with great effort. And so many times I came into these steps and I would relapse and I would come into this, do the steps and I would relapse because there was so much I really didn't understand. And I am more of a fear-based person than I am an anger-based person. I've learned that from many, many inventories that I've done. My life absolutely did not work at any level. It didn't work financially. It didn't work in any area, food-wise, health-wise, hygiene-wise, relationship-wise. My life just did not work. And I became convinced at a very early age that if things were different, I would be happy. If you would do things differently, I could be happy. And we know that that is just not true. So let's take a look at this sentence. And it says, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. And what that means to me today is this. There is much more to the recovery process than eating and not eating. And when I first came in here, and I think that in my 44 years of, of being in these rooms, I've seen this more often than I've seen the other thing. We just keep concentrating on eating, not eating, purging, not purging, uh, anorexia, not anorexia, whatever that may be, starving, restricting. And what we want to take a look at this morning is how much further that can go than just what we're eating. Remember that it says in the second step, it says, came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Now, why doesn't it say came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sobriety? Why doesn't it say that a power greater than myself could restore me to abstinence? Why doesn't it say those things? Because sobriety has a much lower ceiling and is much smaller than sanity. And in order for me to understand some things, I'm going to have to look at my, inner, my, my uh, inventory process, which by this time I have completed and my amends. One of the things that became very apparent to me when I was doing my inventory process is that many of the things that I rely on in my brain to be true are false. And many of the fears that I have, that all fear is unfounded, but the fears that I relied upon and the fears that paralyzed me were really something that was coming out of ego and really something that was holding me back completely. The angers. So what I have to look at at this stage of the game is where am I being insane? And if I'm painstaking about this phase of our development, I'm going to tie it together for you. I'm going to tie you these promises with what we just talked about in step two. Okay. If I'm painstaking about this phase of our development, I start to notice. Now, it doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen in a week or a month or even a couple of years in most cases. But here's what I start to notice. I start to notice a vast improvement in my self-talk. You know, I remember a number of years ago, I had moved to Eugene, Oregon for a business opportunity. And I had been living there for about, oh, I would say a week, maybe less. And I was driving through Eugene, Oregon. Now, this is way before, Eugene, Oregon is not a big city at all. But I was driving around there and we got lost. Me and my wife were lost. And this was in the days well before Google Maps and, you know, all this ways and things like that that you use to navigate. And I was really, really upset at myself. And I was swearing at myself. And I was just very upset. And my then wife said to me, she said, Harlan, if you spoke to your friends the way you speak to yourself, would you have any? And man, that hit me hard because I have a mind that will just beat on me and beat on me and beat on me because I'm not perfect. 
I'm not what I believe I'm supposed to be so that you will like me or accept me because the world for decades and decades of my life sent me a very clear signal that because of my morbid obesity or my extreme morbid obesity, the world was not going to accept me. And so from the time I was a little boy, maybe six, seven years old, I understood that because I was obese, I was unacceptable as I am, that existentially, existentially, I am defective because I eat too much food. And when I came into this program, I believed that it was just another diet club, that if I lose weight, I'm being successful. And if I don't lose weight, then I'm not successful. But what I found out, and again, I'm going to tie the second step into this, is what I found out is that there is more to sanity than just abstinence. And what I found out is that there is more to recovering in life than just losing weight or in the case of the bulimic, you know, uh, a cessation of those behaviors or the anorexic, the cessation of the starvation and restricting. I found out that there is a complete there is a complete catharsis. There is a complete cleansing of the human being as they are. And I had to allow that process into my life, not only by doing the work necessary, but because I had wonderful sponsorship and people came out of the woodwork to help me in ways I didn't even feel I wanted or deserved. I really just wanted to be left alone to die. I didn't really want to live. I saw no point. I knew I couldn't live with the food and I knew I couldn't live without the food. But oh, just as I told you, there were lies that I was relying upon. I found out something to be true that I never would have believed in a million years. And that is, I can have a really good life and not gorge myself with excess food. Isn't that wild that it took me decades of my life to understand that there is real happiness on the other side of abstinence because that was one of the lies that I told myself. And you know what else I found out along the way? I found this out not only by being sponsored, I found this out by sponsoring other people. I found this out by going to thousands of meetings in Chicago, in Skokie, in Buffalo Grove, in Highland Park, in Deerfield, in God knows where. I found this out by going to thousands and thousands Thousands of Overeaters Anonymous meetings, what I found out was the very things that were eating at me also ate at other people. And my ego told me another lie that I relied on. And the lie that my ego told me is that these thoughts, these ideas that I had of resentment and food and eating, and this idea that I was completely unacceptable, not just to, to humankind, but I was unacceptable to myself. And whether or not I was unacceptable to the human race is secondary. When I started to grow along lines that God set down, I started to notice the greatest miracle I never thought would happen to me. I started to accept myself and then acceptance of myself grew into a healthy self-respect, a healthy self-respect, not a narcissistic personality disorder, not a overblown sense of self, but a realistic sense that I am human and that I do make mistakes, but I am not a mistake. I do things that are dumb, but I'm not dumb. I do things that other people don't understand, but that is part of being a human being. And part of that sanity, again, I'm tying in step two with these promises, very important. And that is what I have to see is that the painstaking effort that it takes to recover cannot, should be, must not be an event. 
See, we cannot see this work as an event. And so many of us, including me, including me, I wanted to pass go and collect my $200. It doesn't work that way. I have to continue to work the program harder and harder and harder and harder. Let me level with you. Let me level with the hundred, almost 160 people that are here. Let me level with you. I don't want to work as hard as I do on my program. And you don't need to give me a medal. I already have the greatest reward in the world. And that is a life that does not include the shame and the guilt and the horrorish, the nightmare and horror of compulsive overeating. But I have a life that includes beauty and grace and faith in God. But this second step and this painstaking reference to the work that needs to be done cannot be seen as an event. It must be seen as an ongoing process. I'm very, very lucky, very lucky. This has been an amazing year for me so far. I had a business thing come, you fall into my lap. Uh, unfortunately, it was something that happened to a friend of mine, and, and this turned out to be something very good for me, and, and that's great, and I'm in a situation I never thought I would be in, in, in you know, in a, in a very important area of my life, and, and, and I have lots of friends, lots of people that I've known. I was out to dinner last night with three other men that I have, two of the men that I was out to dinner with, I have known them since September of 1959, when we started kindergarten together as children, five-year-old children. How lucky am I to have such wonderful friends? And the other friend, I have known him since 1967, and he and I are, are very good friends. We talk all the time. We communicate all the time. He and his brother are dear friends of mine. I wouldn't trade them for Fort Knox. I wouldn't trade them for Fort Knox. But we have to see that the relationship we have, not only with God, but with ourselves, is the same kind of relationship. Now, what am I driving at? I'm driving at the fact that if I don't return their phone calls, if I don't communicate with them, if I don't work at these relationships, they will go away. They will die by attrition and we will no longer have a relationship. Now we can see that very clearly. We can see it clearly with people, but often don't see it with God. And the relationship that I have with that power greater than myself, and I don't want to offend anybody and say, I'll call it God, I'll call him Izzy, because Izzy is one of my names for God, okay? My relationship with Izzy needs daily work. And every single day of my life, I do the morning part of step 11, I do the evening part of step 11, and I do other things as well. But it has to be worked at. And so much of the time, I want to hit and run. I want to just see it as an event. And when it's an event, I want to be done with it. And it's behind me. And we're moving on. It does not work that way for me. Perhaps it works that way for you. It never worked that way for me. And if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, which phase of our development? The development of our spiritual life. Because remember, earlier in the page, a couple of paragraphs up, it says the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. And if we're living something, we are taking action. Now, I'm going to give you my opinion. You don't have to pay attention to it. I, I, this is not verifiable in the big book. This is just me sharing with you. What I think about the most during the day, what I act upon the most during the day is God. If all I'm doing all day long is obsessing about money, that becomes my God. If all I'm doing every day is obsessing about sex, 
or I'm obsessing about what people are thinking of me. Most of the time, they're not thinking anything of me. But the bottom line is that becomes my God. So what I do is I build in little alarms, if you will. I build in little times during my day when I think about God and I stop and pray. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate. It doesn't have to be, oh my God, I'm going to run to the synagogue. No, I can just close my eyes for a second, unless I'm driving, unless I'm driving. I can close my eyes for a second and I can say, thank you, God. Thank you for letting me live this long. It's been an awesome journey. I wouldn't want to relive the first part of it, to tell you the truth, but it's been an amazing amazing journey, especially lately. And so I have to work at this. And how do I work at this? Because I know in the questions and answers, somebody's going to say, I just don't know. I don't get how to work at this. And I'll give you a little secret of mine. If you are looking for God and you don't seem to be able to find God, look for him in the face of one of his children. What do I mean by that? Get out of yourself and go make an outreach call. Get out of yourself. Call your her, the person in your meeting that is struggling. And, you know, we always think of the newcomer. We, you know, because we're trained to do that. We're trained to think, oh, I'm going to call a newcomer. And you should. That's fantastic. That's great. But let me let you in on a little secret, too. There are people that have been in these rooms for years that are dying of their untreated addiction. And they are circling the drain and they need a call too. Don't let somebody's, don't let somebody's longevity in meetings be a deterrent to reaching out to them. There are people in these rooms, and I was one of them. There are people in these rooms for years that are dying of their untreated addiction. They are all around us. They are in the meetings if you go to live meetings. They're in the meetings if you go to Zoom meetings. They are out there and they need an outreach call too. So one of the things that I want to impart on all of you is when I can't seem to locate God, the place I look for him is in the face of one of his children. And when I look for him in the face of one of his children, I find him 100% of the time. In working on my program, in doing my inventories, in going to meetings, in sponsoring others, in being sponsored, I grow as a human being and my relationship with God gets richer and deeper and my relationship with myself and others gets richer and deeper. You know what people said to me for years? They said this to me for years. You can't love another person unless you love yourself. And I thought to myself, what a bunch of crap. What a bunch of garbage that you would say that to somebody. I see people all the time. They're dating and they're in relationships and they hate themselves or whatever. What I didn't understand is that there is a vast difference between being in a relationship and having the ability to truly love someone else and yourself and bring God into the equation, bring that recovery, bring that, that higher power into the equation. For me, I cannot speak for anyone else. If I put another person first above God, I am idol worshiping in a sense. I'm idol worshiping. I have to keep God first, above the business, above anything else, above finance, above romance. And that can be very hard to do. And the reason that it's hard to do is it's easier for me to push what God thinks of me aside because I want the person to like me. I want the person or people to accept me. And so I will do things dishonestly. 
I will lie. I will become a different person. I was a chameleon for years. If you wanted me to be a Democrat, I was a Democrat. If you want me to be a Republican, I was a Democrat. No, I'm kidding. I was a Republican. I was whatever you wanted me to be so that you wouldn't run away from me. And today, I still don't want people to run away from me, particularly if I like them. But what I have to understand is I've had people run away from me and I have survived. I am not dead. My wife left me. I'm still alive. I've had people leave me, male, female, whatever that may be. People have left me and said, I no longer want to travel your path. I'm going to go on a different path and that that's okay. What does it say in the book? Roomy, all inclusive. The road to God is wide and roomy and inclusive. And it's not up to me to determine or try to control who walks my path. Yes, it's painful when people go their own way. Yes, I don't want to lose you at the fork in the road. But you know what? With God's help, I will not only survive, I will thrive. And I will not only live another day. I will be better off for it because of the lessons learned. But I, I now see the wisdom that unless I'm willing to put God, this is just for me, I don't know, unless I'm willing to put God first, and unless I'm willing to be true to my program, no matter who sees what I do, no matter who thinks what about my program, I don't have anything to give. So this has to be first for me. Painstaking means detailed, hard, difficult work. Not that it's difficult, but it's it, it, the the work here is is difficult at times. It's not complex. I, I don't want to confuse you. The work is never complex. If you're confused, if you, if you just don't understand it, you're probably doing it wrong. But to dig deep into my own life, to see where my ego has, has been killing me is often very, very painful. But the wages here are very high very high. I'll let you in on a secret. You can't tell anyone. I went out to dinner last night with these three friends of mine, and I used to outweigh these guys by three, 400 pounds. I outweighed these guys. Every one of them today, every one of them weighs more than me. Every one of them weighs more than me. And I was so stoked when I looked and I said, you know what? They weigh more than me. I know I, I shouldn't be thinking that way, but I really did think that, even though it's not, it's not nice to think that I was thinking it. All right, let's get back to serious. Let me just blow my nose here because everything here is in bloom. Everything here is spring is in the air. Spring is springing and my nose is suffering. <laughs> okay. Oh, God, these fakakta allergies. Oh, my God in heaven. Oh, Lord. Okay. Now, so we see the tie in between the relationship with God and the relationship with ourselves and the relationship that we are now open to with other people, be they workers, co-workers, be they relatives, be they your, your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, whatever that may be, or your children or your parents, whatever that may be. When you are at peace, because you are in recovery, and I have to work at this. I don't. I don't just naturally go to peace. I naturally go to panic. I go to peace says not peace. I go to panic mode anytime something, somebody, or something tries to introduce a change into my life. My first reaction is, oh, no. My my default mode is, if it works, don't fix it. If it doesn't work, don't fix it homeostasis don't change a thing don't confuse me with facts my mind's already made up my mind is well made up don't confuse me with facts i was having a conversation not long ago and something came to light came to my my consciousness about something i had thought and all of a sudden i oh my god you know it was just, it was like an epiphany. It was just unbelievable. But so these are the things I have to look at. And what I have to look at specifically, again, before we move on are 
what lies am I telling myself and believing and relying upon? What lies am I telling myself or others? What information am I relying upon that is just destroying me because it's not true? The other thing I have to remember is this is something that has to be worked at. So oftentimes in the 44 years that I've been here, I have done this. I go to the same meetings every week, every day. I go to Swedish, I went to Swedish Covenant. I used to go downtown to Northwestern Hospital in the doctor's dining room. We had the meeting there Friday night. I would go to Bethesda Hospital. Then I met someone. I moved out to the suburbs. I went to Buffalo Grove. I went to the Deerfield Library, Highland Park Hospital. That was my schedule. That was my routine. And I followed that routine for long periods of time. Here's what I learned and here's what was pounded into me by life. I have to continue to do more and different, more and different. Why do I have to do more? I don't want to do more. You mean to tell me for the love of God, am I really the only guy west of the Mississippi that can take a freaking 10 step? I mean, sometimes I have to think that. I mean, am I the only guy west of the Mississippi that can take an outreach call? But here's what I learned. My disease is permanent, progressive, and fatal if untreated. Permanent, progressive, and fatal. Every single day when I get up, my disease overnight got worse. Not better, not the same, worse. And what does that mean to me? That means I have to dig deeper, do more, and I have to be more painstaking about my efforts at recovery. And if I'm not, I am not going to be able to keep up with the progressive nature of the disease. The current effort that I'm doing is going to be inadequate in a very short period of time. I often have to look at different things. I have to maybe go to some different meetings. I have to maybe do some service that I may not want to do. But you know what? I better get my butt in gear because the disease is permanent. The disease is progressive. And if it's untreated, it is fatal. What could be more important for me to do than to save the one life that I have? This is not a dress rehearsal. And so many times in my life, I was suffering tremendously, but unwilling to change. Let me say that again, because I think it's something I need to hear. There were many, many times in my life where I was suffering to the point of tears, but I was completely and utterly unwilling to change. Now that doesn't make any sense, but it made perfect sense to me because if you hadn't have done that to me, if the world hadn't have screwed me over, if the world hadn't have done that to me, I wouldn't be in the situation that I'm in and it's your fault. And if there's anything I'm addicted to, as, as, as addictive as the food is, self-pity is also an addictive substance for me. I want instant results or it's poor me. I want results. We have a friend that lives in, we all have a friend who lives in South New Jersey. And she says frequently, I'm very sorry you didn't get the results from the work you did not do. So I have to continually remind myself that this is not a dress rehearsal. I'm Time is going. In about 15 minutes, it's going to be the end of May. I'm going to be 69 years old. I don't have that much more time left. I'm closer to 80 than I am 50. I'm getting scared. Holy mackerel. This, just this week, I had a friend of mine that had a heart attack, quadruple bypass. She's in a hospital in Wisconsin. And I had another friend of mine. I've known, I've known these people for 50, 60 years. Uh, he has a spot on his lung. And, you know, we're getting to be an age now where, oh boy, you know, it's, it's getting kind of scary. It's getting kind of scary. But I walked three miles this morning and I didn't have to stop. And my health is good. So for today, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm okay. 
but I have to keep working at it. So let's let's move on. But the the point that I'm trying to make is re-look at things. Look at things through the eyes of your sponsor. Look at things through the other people that you talk to. And if you're not talking to other people, you're not getting the feedback that you may need. You've got to pick that up and say, I'm going to make a call. I know here's my phone. As long as I'm not using it, I can lift it quite easily. I'm trying not to cover up Porky Pig's face over there because I know Porky Pig is behind me over there with Daffy Duck and the rest of them and, and Yosemite Sam and, and, uh, and that. But the bottom line is when I go to make an outreach call, this phone weighs about 20,000 pounds and it's hard to lift up. Well, take a weightlifting class for the love of God and do what you need to do to pick up that phone because there's life for you at the other end and there's life for them at the other end. Very, very important. I'm going to quote you something because we're on the subject of outreach calls. We're on the subject of sponsorship. We're on the subject of learning who we are and accepting who we are and loving who we are, not in a narcissistic lunatic way, not in a, you know, this, this, this crazy way of, you know, this narcissism, but let's, let's listen to something because it's important. Cling to the thought that in God's hands, the dark past is the greatest possession you have. I read those words every day of my life. The key to life and happiness for others, with it, you can avert death and misery for them. Now, if you're doing that, I'm going to tie you to something that occurs on page 63. And what I like to do is I like to tie you into the places in the big book where this tapestry is woven, where all this stuff is coming together. It doesn't, when Bill Wilson wants to teach us something, he doesn't teach us to us once. He doesn't say anything once. He, what he does is he weaves it into the tapestry and he repeats it over and over again. This spirals the information. He spirals the information. But let's take a look on page 63 because we've been talking about service. Let's tie it together. It says here, when we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. What position is that? God is the director. We are the actors. God is the, is the uh, principal. We are his agents. He is the father. We are his children. That's what we're referring to. It says here, we had a new employer. Being all powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. So if I'm performing his work well, I am going to be taken care of. Now, here's the danger. I'm going to go back to page 83. Here's the danger in this. And I love telling you this. I hate the results that it often brings. Here's the error. Nobody is promising you instant results. Just because I make a couple of outreach calls, there's no Lamborghini parked in front of my house. Just because I make a couple of outreach calls doesn't mean that there's a billion dollars in my living room in a bag. It doesn't mean that. Life is life. Things are things. But what happens is you've got to give God an opportunity You've got to give God the benefit of that gestation period. This is not I dream of genie. This is not bewitched. Nobody is going to twitch their nose or rub a lamp and give you the numbers for tonight's lottery drawing. It doesn't work that way. How it does work is when I do self-esteemable activities like make an outreach call, like to do service, like to go do a workshop in uh, Dallas or in, um, what do you call it? Where else am I going? On California, Silicon Valley. When you do those kind of things, you hate yourself less. And when you hate yourself less, you become open to possibilities. But it's not instant results. There's no quid pro quo. It's not like I'm going to make an outreach call to Fred 
and I'm going to make an outreach call to Larry. And then when I'm done with Fred and Larry, I get a Maserati. Uh Uh-uh, you're barking up the wrong tree. When I make the outreach call to Fred and I make the outreach call to Larry, there's a very good chance that I can bring them something. And there's a wonderful chance that they're going to bring something to me. For those of you who call me, for those of you who I have contact with, if I could do for you what you have done for me, I would be doing a lot because you are my teachers. You are my instructors. You are my in the field agents. You know things about me that I never looked at before in 68 years of life. The little things that you've told me are a hundred percent of the reason that not only am I still alive, but I'm in recovery. I'm in recovery because each one of you is my professor. Each one of you teaches me about who I am. And so this is a process. This is something you have to trust your God. You have to know that there is a gestation period. Let me just put this into perspective for you. I'm alive I want to be alive. For decades of my life, I beg God for death. I'm alive. I want to be alive. My life functions to, to a degree. I have friends. I have other interests. I have people that I adore them, and hopefully they adore me. I don't know. But what happens is I become more invested in what God thinks of me and less invested and less dependent upon what other people think of me. Now, do I still want people to like me? Of course I do. Of course I do. But I do know at the bottom line, I will survive and thrive. And before we leave this sentence, we're almost, you know, it's almost tempting just to keep going with it. But remember my father, most of his friends, not all of them, but most of his friends came out of the concentration camps in Europe. And because they came out of mostly Auschwitz, because my dad was Russian, but more actually he's Russian, but he was more Polish in culture than he was Russian. But because they came out of, you know, all Dachau and Bergen-Belsen and, and, and Auschwitz and, you know, all these uh, uh, places, they would say to me, independently of one another, they didn't all get together and say, now, what are we going to tell the fat little kid? No, they didn't do that. They would grab my face and squeeze my cheeks like this. And they would say, live until you die. Live until you die. And for a long time, I thought live until you die meant you eat all the candy you can eat. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means go out there and live a life. Live your life. Now, there's a book and it's about a concentration camp. I hate to keep bringing that up. I hate to keep bringing that up because it's a dark subject. But I want to I want to illustrate something for you as we're talking about this sentence. And the man writes about a weed that was coming through the floor of the barracks of this camp. And it was a weed and it was pushing itself through the floorboard to live. In this horrible, nightmarish place where the greatest crime against humanity has ever taken place in the most horrific, horrific, nightmarish place that God ever saw was a weed pushing itself through the floorboard, searching for life. And if a weed can search for life, what about us? What about us? What are we doing today to search for life? Are we waiting for God to show himself? Are we waiting for people to change? Are we waiting for this disease to go away? You're going to wait forever. I have a friend of mine. He lives in Los Angeles, California. He says, you're going to eventually stop eating. Let's just hope it's while you're still alive. Eventually, you're going to stop drinking, drugging, whoring, whatever you're doing, gambling, 
you know, eventually you're going to stop. Let's just hope it's while you're still alive. If this weed can break through floorboards in search of life, what can we do? What we can do is we can do three things. We can recover, we can recover, and we can recover. Those are the things we can do. So I had to stop filling my head with what I cannot do, don't want to do, shouldn't do. And my favorite is, it's not fair, I have to do this. If I was thin and I was rich and I was this, I wouldn't have to do this. You know what? I'm glad I have to do all that stuff because it makes for a great life. It makes, I wouldn't mind being rich, no. But the bottom line is, is that it makes for a tremendously fulfilling life. Recovery brings me closer to God and brings me closer to other people. Do I have friends that are not in recovery? Absolutely. Absolutely, I do. And I don't talk about this stuff with them. They'd have me locked up. I have a friend of mine who lives in the Bay Area. He thinks I'm half nuts anyway. He wants me off the street anyway. But the bottom line is, is that when we live this way, recovery becomes very easy. It's really not a big trick to stay out of the food. Oh, every once in a while, oh, every once in a while, I'll get a smell in my mouth or not my mouth, my nose. I'll get a smell. Of course, it's hard for me to smell anything now. My allergies are just bouncing off the walls because uh, it, of what's going on here. I mean, relative to spring, it's springing. Everything is in bloom here. Um, but the bottom line is, is that we have one life, one life. You know, one of the saddest days in the history of humanity is April the 29th, 1865. What happened on April the 29th, 1865, about a hundred miles east of New Orleans, Louisiana, a fight broke out between forces of the Confederacy and forces of the Union Army. 17 men were killed and another 29 were injured. Why is that so horrible? Why is that so horribly pathetic? Because on April 9th, 1865, Lee surrendered to Grant. The war was over. When I was a little boy in the 60s, early 60s, every once in a while in the Philippines or in Manila in the Philippines or in some of these Pacific islands, they would find a Japanese soldier that was holed up in there that wouldn't leave. There was one famous incident where they actually had to find the guy's uh, uh, officer, his commanding officer, and bring the commanding officer to the Philippines to convince this guy that the war was over, that it was okay to come out. Now, that may seem crazy, huh? What battles are we fighting that don't exist? What battles are we fighting that were over decades ago? Are you getting one over on your aunt by resenting her? Are you getting one over on your mom or your dad or your husband or your wife? Are you getting one over on them by hanging on to that resentment and F them? And I'm going to get rid of every other resentment, but not that one. I'm going to hate that person. I'm going to resent that person. You're killing yourself. I know I've done it. Resentment is the number one offender. It kills more alcoholics than anything else. Selfishness, self-seeking, that we think is the root of our trouble. Do you want me to keep going? I could do this all night. What is Bill telling us? What is the big book telling us? That at some minute, some point, it is inherent for us to, to it is inherent on us to let that go. It's inherent on us. It's, it's, it's incumbent on us to let it go. Yes, they were jerks. 
to you. Yes, you offended somebody and they did whatever they did. And you were a jerk then. You were just a human being. You were young. You were 20. You were 30. You were 31. Whatever it is, you were young. You didn't know any better. If you knew better, you'd have done better. I get embarrassed by mistakes I made in the past too. I get embarrassed by lies I told in the past too. I get embarrassed by things I did in the past too. That's part of the human condition. But we have to come to a point in our lives where we see it almost outside ourselves, that we were another person then, that we could have done better had we known better. What are we hanging on to? What are we clinging to that's never worked? We're like drowning people and we're clinging to a big rock. And we're not going to drop that rock. It's my rock. I ain't dropping the rock. And they're yelling at you from the boat, drop the rock. And you won't drop that rock. And if you don't drop that rock, you're going to drown. You're going to die. This is the same thing. It's the same exact thing. Drop the rock or die. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot hate your dad or hate your husband or hate your boss or hate your wife or, or your former lover or your cousin or whoever the hell it is. You can't hate them and resent them and recover. It doesn't work that way. We are human beings. Yes, things are going to trigger an idea. You're going to remember, oh, yeah, she was a witch or she was this or she was that. Oh, yes, I have an ex-wife, too. I get it. I understand. But I wish her well. I truly, seriously, I wish her well. To sit and for me to hate her means I'm moving toward almond joy. I'm moving toward cookies. I'm moving toward cake. I don't want to do that. And sometimes people get so wrapped up in slavery and the Holocaust and the, the, the injustices to Native Americans. And those are nightmarish injustices. I am not diminishing them at all in the least. I wish those hadn't happened. But walk me through how eating Chips Ahoy cookies is going to free one slave. Walk me through how me eating cupcakes is going to free people from the torture of the trail of tears. Walk me through how me eating pizza from, from a place in Chicago that I love well. It's in Chicago. I know exactly where it is. Walk me through how that's going to save one person from Hitler's gas chamber. Walk me through it. How is me dying going to help any of them? And the answer is, it's not. So how could God and how could this? God cried too. But he gave human beings free will. And as such, he gave them will, free will to do good or to do bad. There is really no good or bad. It's only my ego that makes it so. But he gave people the opportunity to do evil things to each other. And that's just unfortunate. See, he didn't put a bunch of robots on the, on the earth. We're not robots. We're not cyborgs. We are humans with free will. And some of us did some things that are horrific horrible. Is this the hill I want to die on, though? Is this where it all comes apart for me? Is this the hill that I want to die on? Because I could insist that God sucks because there was a Holocaust, or God sucks because there was slavery, or God sucks because of racial injustice, or God, there's a million reasons. But is this the hill that I want to die on? That's a question I have to ask myself every day. Yes, this is a serious thing. There's injustices all over this world. I read the Chicago Tribune online every day. And when I open up the paper, I can't get past page five without some kid getting his brains blown out. 
I read this morning how Chicago leads the world in auto theft, carjacking, you name it. I'm ashamed of that, but I'm also afraid because I'm going home more now than I used to. I'm spending more time at home in Chicago than I used to. And you can bet your life that scares the crap out of me. Not out at Pooh Park, but I mean downtown scares the crap out of me. But how is me eating Chips Ahoy going to fix that problem? And the answer is it can't. But how many thousands of candy bars were eaten and pizzas eaten because God didn't do this or God didn't do that? Well, God cried too. He didn't want to see people on the trail of tears. He didn't want to see people, you know, at, in, in, in chattel slavery. He didn't want that. He didn't want people in the concentration camps to die and be tortured. And if that's the God you have in your head, look at the God you have and maybe think about changing it. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is it. This is it. You don't get to come back and do it again. You just don't. I wish we did. I, if I can come back with what I know now, oh, I would do a lot different. Oh, I'd do a lot different. <sighs> but bottom line is, man, that's about the 80th time I've blown my nose today. But anyway, the bottom line is still this. Life is worth living. We don't know how much time we have left. Let's look at these things. Are we working on our relationship with God? Are we working on our relationship with ourselves through service and self-sacrifice for others? Are we sponsoring? Are we sponsored? Do we have a sponsor and are we sponsoring? If that's appropriate. I mean, if you're on step one and you're new and you're, you know, you're just coming out of the food. No, of course not. But at some point you have to step up and be a sponsor. At some point you have to give service. It is inherent upon each and every one of us to serve God to the very best of our ability. And if we do, he will provide for us all the things that we need. Do I have a Lamborghini outside? I checked. No, no Lamborghini, no Lambo. But the bottom line is I have my car and it works and it gets me where I want to go. Let's take another look at some of these things we've been relying upon. And let's do a little more and let's do a little different. And if we do, it really makes a difference, not just in the lives of others. It makes a difference for us and the possibilities that God will make miracles happen in your life increase with every action that you take. I am in places today in my life I could never have gotten to had I not trusted God enough to take these actions and I could never have gotten where I am today in lots of different areas of my life. The main one being I'm still alive. I'm still alive. Yesterday, somebody said to me, we never thought you would ever live this long. We thought you'd be one of the first to go. And I'm here. So before I turn it back, you didn't think we could spend the whole hour on just one sentence, did you? But I sort of did. So, all right. Anyway, before I turn it back, what I'd like to do is I would like to um, ask you that if you are, have you, if you asked a question last week, step back and let people who didn't come forward and please, for the love of God, no math. I gave up math for Lent. And I'm the first Jewish kid to give up something for Lent. Um, and I'm going to turn it back. But no math and no food questions. Let's not sully this up with food questions. Let's leave this half hour to questions that will help us in our growth period. If you have um, food questions, um, there's a time for that and it's not now. And there's a there's a person to ask and it's probably not me. So I'm going to give it back to either Maria or Nancy or Audrey. I don't know who. And I'm going to give it back to you guys. <laughs>